Nosso próximo e último desta noite uh, traz para vocês uma série de questões muito importantes. Eu uh, devo começar, sou um grande fã do trabalho dele e da forma de pensar dele uh, e nos leva a questionar algumas coisas. O que é uma fonte? Como funciona a ideia de uma fonte? Uh, para que, que uh, como que a gente interpreta uma fonte? Como que a gente usa toda a questão uh, de forma, de estrutura, de espaço em branco? Uh, é que ele foi um pouco além daquilo que se faria normalmente com uma pesquisa. E ele foi atrás da estrutura ótica, da forma de percepção de como a gente vê. Quanto Porra, né? Até você, caralho. É bullying do baixinho. Veja, isso é um T. Né? Altura X, ascendente e tal, dá um T condensa. Na... Bom, então, ele, né? este grande homem aqui da pesquisa, uh, vai apresentar para vocês agora uh, uma pesquisa dele importante que mostra, principalmente, acho que é um dos pontos mais importantes aqui, uh, como você percebe, como você interpreta Uh, uma família tipográfica. E nós não estamos falando do ponto de vista estético, e sim do ponto de vista fisiológico, que, uh, por incrível que pareça, deveria ser uma das preocupações, vamos dizer, estruturais do desenho tipográfico. Mas o resto eu deixo com vocês. Por favor, queridos, a última coisa. Uh, this is, hello, I've been told, sorry. Uh, my name is Eric, um, I'm from uh, the Netherlands. Uh, I make type and I write software. And I know my talk is right between uh, your coffee break and dinner, so <laughs> if you get hungry, or cranky. Um, this was one of the first things I saw in Brazil. I, I try not to be offended by, <laughs> but I was told it's not personal, so. Um, all right. Um, in Holland, uh, this is my office. I think it's more interesting. These are this is my collection of pens. And this is the word technology on the Science Museum in London, one of my most favorite places. And these two slides combine, I think, what um, I find interesting in type of topography is that it is about making pretty things and drawings, and, but it's also very much about technology. It has to work, it has to work on machines. So, um, Over the years, I think this is a, a little bit of theory I, I developed. Imagine uh, a space that is abstract, that contains all of your ideas, all of our combined ideas. Your ideas, my ideas, the ideas of people before us, the ideas of people after us. It's infinite in all directions. It's huge. This I call the idea space. Now, a small section of that um, is something that a tool can do. So with a hammer, you can do hammer things. Uh, with Photoshop, you can do Photoshop things. Um, there's no way that a hammer will ever do Photoshop things, or that a Photoshop will do hammer things. So these are separate little bits. Once you start working with a tool, you get a bit of an idea of what it can do. That's the, the red thing in the middle. You're, you get experience. And your experience grows. You're a professional. You, you know what you're doing. Now you can look clients in the eye and say, I can make that for you. And at some point, you know everything that the tool can do. You've reached the horizon of the tool. Um, and this is an interesting moment. You might not be aware of it, because it's all a bit fuzzy. Now, Photoshop will do an infinite number of things, and a hammer will do an infinite number of things, but still. Um, at some point, You have to choose between making a compromise or improvise. What happens if your idea is here? Uh, we can deal with this. If your idea is here, it's nice, I can fix it. What happens if my idea is over there? I might use a different program. What happens if my idea is right there? I'm in trouble. Because, well, it's Friday, uh, client needs it soon, I need to get it done, uh, I want to go home. So you say, oh well, 
I'll take my idea and change it a little bit, and then I can do it with Photoshop, or I can do it with my hammer, or whatever. But there's nothing wrong with your idea. It was fine, that, that spark that came to your head. You can blame Photoshop, maybe, for not having anticipated that idea. Um, but on the other hand, Photoshop and the Photoshop programmers, they're doing their best, but it's our job to come up with new things every now and then, right? As designers, we're supposed to do things. So, journalists writing in Microsoft Word, or accountants doing stuff in, in Excel, usually not so likely to do new things, or at least, you know, you don't... It's not that a, a journalist needs to write a new word, and the text editor doesn't know how to do it. You know, it, it all will work. But we have ideas for graphics or animation, we have ideas for programs, and the tools don't work. So what do you do? I think, well, we, you take control. And that sounds, if, if, you, if you look at this from the perspective of a painter, you think, well, no, I don't get the color I wanted in the art store, so I'll stop painting. No. <laughs> They get the pigments and the right oil and the right stuff and they start mixing their own paint and they get really good at make, making that paint and they know everything there is about that paint independent of how they draw it or what, you know, what their paintings say or they know their stuff, they know the material uh, Imagine a musician, a guitar player knows exactly which strings or which element or you know, which amplifier, which fuzz box, which lamps but then for designers, somehow we you know, we open up our creative suite and we stop thinking. <laughs> and um, you know, the, the most, the biggest creative act is is picking uh, filter B rather than filter C because I'm feeling crazy today. So that's a little bit sad. So how do you deal with this? So well, there's another problem. So we all make these compromises, and that's okay. We all have to pay bills, we all have to get stuff done. But, we're all using the same tools. So, anybody not using InDesign or Illustrator or Photoshop? I mean, there must be some. There's, there's some open source stuff, there's... No? Really? <laughs> so, we're all making the same compromises. And that means that some parts of that idea space will be left empty, and some parts of that idea space will be overpopulated. Right? So, start writing your own. Start writing your own software. Um, Dimitri showed some of this. I think it's an excellent example. And, you know, more and more people are getting into this. You don't have to be a computer scientist to write your own software. It doesn't have to be good code. It can be crappy code. But the best thing about that code is that it's right there on your computer. You know how it works. And you can, you can run it. And you've written it. So you can write five lines of code that take, takes a file from one program, fixes or changes something, and it saves it as something else. It can be really, really simple. Just to glue one program to another, or to put something upside down, or to sort, or find something. It can be really stupid, dumb things, but it gets you further, and it lets you, uh, rather, that you rather than compromising your ideas to what the tool can do, you extend the tools to your ideas, which is what we need to do as designers, right? Our ideas should lead, I think. Come on, you agree. Yes, you do. <laughs> All right, right or I'll go back to the program, but um, first I'll have to show how bloody old I am. Um, 20 years ago, uh, even more than 20 years, I think this is 19, some of this is 1989. Oh my god. Alright, I was, I was 20 something, 21. Um, I was with Just van Rossum, my, my colleague, we were both working in Berlin. Uh, we had big computers for that time. And a postcard printer and a boss who didn't really uh, care much, or at least the boss thought, you know, we could play with this. And we, we took a typeface that went into the code that makes the typeface. 
and add its own instructions so that it's no longer a single shape, but then the shape moves around, the, the points move. So every time that letter is printed, it will get a new shape. It's not a very pretty shape. Uh, it, it, you know, it, looks, it will cut your fingers if you touch it. But in color separations, in CMYK, it looks, it looks pretty. It took forever to print, it was really slow. But there's another thing we discovered. Um, we had a scanner, a 300 dpi SCSI scanner, and photographer, and streamline, and illustrator. And we, we chained all these things together. I think we can take shapes that are not fonts, and we can turn them into fonts. So I took my handwriting into a font. This is old stuff, and right? it, it, it's no longer so important, but um, then people actually use this. And I think this is a small bridge to, to uh, Vincent's presentation, <coughs> is that if you make a font and you give it away, you have no control over how it is used. <laughs> and people use it one way, then it's nice, and they use it another way, it's not so nice. It's not my fault, you know? it's not Vincent's fault. <laughs> uh, people do dumb things, I think this is my handwriting. Somebody clearly did not feel burdened by you know, any aesthetics. I was happy to make this, congratulations, on the birth of your baby. Um, so this is, uh, I don't want to judge it as a design, it's like somebody just had fun doing it. And blimey, all right. This is another example. Um, the recent elections in Norway got a really right-wing party uh, and they got a victory. And this is, this is uh, the, the He's not the president of the party now, but he's at least the leading figure of this party. And their whole campaign used Eric Reitman. There's nothing I can do about this. I don't sympathize with them. I cannot say stop, please don't. But, you know, <laughs> there it is. I, I support them, I guess. Or at least my right hand supports them. Which, which leads me to another contentious question. Was this slide face chosen because it has a right hand in the name? At least, you know. Bloody Nazis? <laughs> Who knows? Anyway. Um, that little update. Nobody likes the update, but I just wanted to fix a couple of things. Now it looks like this. It's a little bit better. All right. Uh, just my uh, my uh, associate at the time, just Van Gossen, uh, also did his handwriting. He did a thinner letter, and this is him in, uh, in New York. Showing his left face. Actually, he's showing his left hand with his right hand. Uh, this was a, this is one that at some point there was a TV series that used this as a logo, and then there was a movie that used it, and there was another movie. Um, at the time when I made this, uh, it was funny because you had this really expensive computer, and you could make it look like a really bad typewriter. Of course, that joke is gone. Um, I used so many points that it would crash the laser printer. Now, that's relative because I have so many points. It doesn't care, the computers have increased their memories, the computers are, are no longer breaking up in a sweat when this font comes along. But people were using it really big on screen, so I thought, you know, rather than these really harsh, uh, straight vectors, um, I should add some, some detail to it. So I wrote some code that takes the old font and it grows moss on them. So, all of a sudden, just a, just a tiny little bit, it doesn't make any difference in weight, but there's a little bit more, a little bit more detail. I don't want to do this by hand. I don't want to print them out, scan them again. Just write a little bit of code. I spend half an hour on it, and there it goes. Of course, the half an hour turns into half a year um, when I discover. Well, it might actually be nice to make the whole thing out of tiny little dots, like it's the ribbon showing through. That would drive me nuts. Uh, 3,000 points per glyph. So, write some code that renders these things, lots of dots. Um, this was before RoboFont, this was in FontLab, and I had found a way of running 10 FontLabs at the same time. And they were all you know, chugging out these, these letters. But by making, by making it a program, each letter could now have any number of weights. So I have, I think there's seven different weights for each glyph. Then it contains full Latin, Cyrillic, and Greek. So the font is over uh, 4,000 glyphs. 
and then each has seven versions, now each has 3,000 points. Um, one font, I think, is 12 megabytes. <laughs> it's not used on the web. <laughs> so, that's Trixie. And here's a little movie uh, I made to do it to show them. Um, but it's painful to show. But is the sound on? Should we try this? No, no, no. Yes, there it goes. that it's not good, that it needs to be wider or a different number or a little bit rougher or a different angle. This insight is a design insight. It comes to you at whatever time it wants, but then you have to start over. So you're not going to. So you're going to ignore good ideas. So you're not designing it, you're just producing it. So I write software that generates these things. Writing software takes a long time. It might not be such a good investment, but keeps me off the street. Um, the program runs and it takes up 15 minutes and it generates, I can look at it and I think, wait, that angle should be a little bit different or I want to have a little bit more noise. And I can change the parameters and do it again. So I solve the production first and then start designing afterwards. I like that. That's more federal. That's what I missed. Uh, when everybody is a sort of a side thing, I think it's the least successful thing I've ever drawn, but I like it. 
um, people were drawing these economic humanists and serif designs. So I thought it needs to have serifs and be really wide. That was huge serifs. It's called Zapata. Um, not sure why anymore. There it is. All right. Oh, okay. Um, this is in the wrong place, but this is uh, again the random font Beowulf. Now in RGB, RGB, colorful glory. Is best really better? This one should have a soundtrack by used as well. Anyway, so. So, more old work. Um, the Twin Cities project. This is uh, ancient history, but it's, it might work as a warning. Uh, an art school wanted a typeface to represent not one, but two cities. Two different cities in uh, Minnesota, uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul's. I find it impossible to draw a typeface for one city. You only end up with really dumb cultural stereotypes. You do it for two cities, you end up with two sets of dumb cultural stereotypes. You, you can't really win. Um, plus, it was a, it was a paid pitch, and there were other people, and we thought, you know what, we're just not going to win. So we might as well give them, give them nice drawings. We thought, what if we make a typeface that can just be anything for anybody? Um, and we collected all sorts of outlines and we, we sorted them in a, a pseudo-scientific way. If you need to impress clients with science, just draw a cube. <laughs> Three axes. So, you know, we thought about this in three different ways, and this is what it looks like. So, uh, we collected all sorts of different letter forms, round ones, strange ones, serif ones, uh, and we put them in a cube, we gave them values, and then, even though all of the letters themselves are discrete, they don't interpolate or morph, um, now, there are different kinds of A's. So, this kind of A will live here and there, even though this one has a different B, and this one has a different B. It doesn't stand out so much, but it would actually work. So, letters would have discrete boundaries in which they would mix with other letters. And that, that worked pretty well. This was a little hand-drawn sketch, at least. The, I like the four dollar line, uh, the, the pseudo, pseudo Renner A, some squiggly things, some round things. This was fun. Um, then the client says, yes, but it's got not, it doesn't really have much to do with the city, does it? Well, we were trying not to, but... Um, and we were talking, so well, how about the weather? Because this is Minnesota, it gets cold. Um, so we looked it up, so you can actually find up-to-date live weather data in, in computer-readable format. So we read a little program, but then if you go to the website, you look at the font, the font will look up the weather, and if it's cold, it will have serifs, <laughs> and if it's warm, it will look loopy and warm, with all of the steps in between, so it will respond to the weather. Of course, it would not respond to the weather while it's in your printer, but well, we, we can't solve all problems at once. That's, people would ask, why is the serif one for cold? Said, well, cold is serious because you die. <laughs> <laughs> that was that. <laughs> why is this coming again? Okay. Uh, slightly more recent, but oh, I'm kind of. I think this is my favorite project I've done uh, in a while. Um, with uh, my friends from House Industries in Delaware. Um, if you don't know them, they, they work together with other designers and sort of make typefaces that belong to a particular era, a particular pop culture section. They do this really, really well. They, they work hard and they have a lot of fun doing it. So when this opportunity came to work with them, uh, when they were going to try to work together with the Eames estate to do this. I, said, I was trying to stand in line in front. I said, I want to do this, I want to do this. I said, all right, you can do this. Now, 
Uh, Ray and Charles Eames were architects from the, uh, the 40s and 50s and 60s. Um, did a lot of things. They made chairs, they made furniture, interiors, but also exhibitions, uh, movies, uh, buildings. They were all over the place. If you haven't, if you don't know them, look, look their work up. Eames, E A M A S. It's, it's wonderful. M E S. Sorry. But they never made a font. So we were inventing typographic fiction. We would make a font that looked like they might have liked it, but like, who knows? But uh, this is what we did. So school book, um, some nice Clarendon. Anybody know the typeface? Of the name of this one? No, I forgot. I think it's Thorogood, one of the Thorogoods. Lots of balls, lots of contrast, super high expansion. Look at that Z. I mean, come on, awesome. I started drawing, getting ideas about how many balls do we want on the two, how many balls do we want on the five. Um, this is also a good slide. I hadn't really drawn a text weight before, or at least a text family before. You've seen all the odd stuff at them. So I wanted to make sure that this was right. Now, one of the things that happens if you do type design, you draw a letter, and then you draw another letter, you try to match the first one. Yeah. You draw another letter, you try to match the first, the first second, the other one, and the first one. Um, you never really question the decisions that you took all the way to the beginning. So you end up with a stroke weight and a particular contrast. That might all be relatively random. And if you never question that, you end up never questioning the most important decisions in your design the proportion, the weight, the contrast. So, I built a small, I think, seven-axis interpolating system. I could control the contrast, the thickness of the strokes, the thicks, the thins, and then I played with this until I find something that I think has the right pattern, the right color. Um, of course, this changed a lot afterwards, but I think that these decisions at the beginning of the design process are cheap because I only have to change five or six letters, or maybe even ten. Whereas, at the end of the design process, when all the weights are done, and I look at my design and I think, you know what? This should have been heavier, or lighter, or fill in whatever needs to be different. That's a really expensive decision. And it's the same decision, it's the same realization. So you need to be aware that certain things are better if you do them early. So, text weights, small caps, uh, finding ways of, of building a relatively big family from thin uh, to a, of medium and black. So this is a one dimension, one dimensional interpolation, but with three masters. So thin, regular and black are drawn. So if you were to interpolate thin and black, you won't get the medium in book. Um, Another example, another really nice thing about working with uh, house industries is that they have really good designers that make these funny things. And it's such a, so inspiring. Look at this. Um, dirty little secret from type design. You think it's about letters? It's about numbers. So you have to draw the first set of numerals, uh, then you have to draw the lining ones, and then you have to draw the old style ones and the old style lining ones. Then you have the superiors, the inferiors, the numerators, and the uh, denominators. And if you're lucky, you also want to do um, tabular, inferior, and tabular, uh, superior. And then, if you cannot make up your mind, uh, you will have a two with balls and a two with a flat part, and a seven with balls and a seven with flat parts. So these reflect all the way down to all of the others, until in the end, your selection of numbers is bigger than the selection of letters. I'm just saying, just a warning. Right. Some of my favorite letters. That S, oh man. That's the most difficult thing I've ever drawn. Over and over and over and over. Uh, this is something German. This is a little pearl necklace as a diagonal that works. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. This was fun. This is on top of the typographic fiction. This is a fiction on top of a fiction. Um, if you look at the Eve's work, uh, the, the movies and exhibitions, and they really like that stencil stuff. But we didn't want to go for the architectural stencil and be historically correct. We wanted to somehow play with that. So these shapes were drawn with, with the, the bent plywood in mind. I was thinking, oh, how would that look like if they would if they turned this into furniture, or if they made this into really nice wooden shapes? And then working with House Industries, actually, they turn it into really big wooden shapes. This is for the exhibition at the, at the Eames campus in Santa Monica. Um, that panel is about that big. And the two is cut out by, by computer, then hand sanded and then lacquered and, and finished. Um, and I have to admit, right in front of you, that it was, it was almost kinky just to follow those curves and just to see how incredibly smooth that is. Actually, you know what? That's, that's why I spent months looking at those shapes and, and, and tweaking them, is because it would be so sad if you make something this big and finish it so nicely, and then you look at that curve and you think, you know, crap. <laughs> <laughs> it's like with the Eric Wright you cannot go back and fix it because it's done. So. A little bit poster two, some funny poster numerals. I like these little systems so that you get two for one. Instead of half weight and this is a double weight kind of wood types. Then we did some arrows. Um, they're automatic, so he switches on and opens up this character. You, you keep hitting, hitting the same button and the arrow keeps getting longer. That must have been a black slide up in between different things, and it was, it was actually a movie. So that's good. Up. Okay. Uh, one, of the, one of the honest uh, hardworking jobs I have is I teach at the Type Media Master. Uh, this is um, a master course in type design at the Royal Academy of Arts. Um, we've had a bunch of really good people from Brazil and from all over the world. And that is really, really uh, um, a nice challenge to, uh, to teach her because, you know, bachelor students. Fine. So, typemedia.org if you want to have a little bit more information about that, uh, or send me an email. This is the guy that is mainly responsible for, for our jobs there, Gerrit um, Mortsen. Um, is one of his books now available in Portuguese. Um, I'm not going to try the title, but it's a stroke in Portuguese. Tasco. Um, which, if you if you read it, and I've had, I've had to, I've had. Uh, the interesting part of his approach is that it is a theory of of analyzing type letter forms without actually going to history and saying this was drawn then and this was drawn after. If you follow this way of, of um, looking at letters, it analyzes the root, the shape, the, the shape of the tool, the path of the tool, how these shapes came to be and what happened to them. What happened to the things? What happened to the things? It's a really down-to-earth analysis of type. It's not the only way of doing type, and I remember that God, I was, uh, he was my teacher. And then I went into the big world and had my first type job. I was looking at these letters, and it was all wrong. Because this has to be thin, this has to be thick. But then, you know, I do learn, I did learn, that there are other valid systems. As long as somehow you make up a system, or you follow a system, you think about it a little bit, you get critical about it, then you're engaging with the matter, you're looking at the form, you're thinking about it. That's important. This is a contrast exercise, making the thick thicker, making the thin thicker. This is before there were CNC routers, this is all made in plaster. This is what we do now. Um, these are not really contrast exercises, but it's, it's not a little bridge. Um, because we have these international students in Holland, um, they're in Holland for 
the 5th of December, which is St. Nicholas Day, which is not a big deal. Um, it has all sorts of really difficult historical references I'm not going to go into. But um, ask me about the, the horse on the roof maybe later over a beer, I'll tell you. But one of the big things is, is that we exchange chocolate letters. Um, and I have a bunch of them here, which I'm trying to give to the dia to go people. But actually, I brought some genuine Dutch, Dutch chocolate letters. Uh, there's some, not, not for all of you, sorry. <laughs> Afterward, the article. Uh, the nice thing is, is that you can. It started in the 19th century, sort of the 1850s. So we, we have these these slap serves. The whole all of the supermarkets are full of slap serves, chocolate letters. That's my job. <laughs> so we figured out a way of, of making these. So the students then make up a 3D letter um, and sculpt this, and now we have a little improvised vacuum former. You get a plastic shape and you can cast your chocolate and you can make your own chocolate letters. Um, which is nice. Who says letters? And you can eat them. <laughs> so, every year we, we, we send uh, between 10 and 12 new type designers into the, the, the crazy outside world. And um, God knows what happens to them. Some of them end up at all. Uh, these are two projects. Uh, the year before last, on the left is a project called Mot by Hervoje Zivcic from Croatia, Hervoje. And on the right is Blanco by Dave Foster from Australia. And they're different than the same. They're not a sans and serif pair as you now kind of expect them when you take a sans and then you add some low contrast serifs and you say, look, it's a slab, it's a family. They're really totally different. They have different references, different origins, different proportions. Actually, they don't. They started comparing their proportions early in the design process and say, well, what is your X height? What is your cap height? And sort of, they started adjusting them, that, that they became more similar, that you could use them next to each other. One for text, one for headlines, or the other way around. Or, um, and I think this is a really interesting new idea. Rather than have one fa super family that tries to be everything, just get two that like each other. But they're not married, and they're certainly not siblings. You know, they, they could be parents. Anyway, more work. Um, the thin one is from Alexandra Samelyenkova from uh, Russia. Um, uh, Latvia, I'm so sorry. Uh, and two more, whose names I've forgotten, I'm sorry, because it's kind of warm. But. So, one of the things we're trying to get people to do is make these decisions early, to think about shapes early, to think about the contrast and the weight and the proportion after you've drawn one letter, rather than you've drawn 700 ligatures, and then you start thinking about the contrast, and then you think, oh, well, it's too much work now. This is the thing about the design process. It's biological, right? It happens in our brains. Um, insight does not come when you need it. You have your ideas, you do your work, and you wish you had insight. You can taste it. You can see it right beyond the edge of your screen. But you can't put your hands on it. This insight is going to come eventually, right? So it would be really sad if it didn't. But it's going to do so at whatever moment that insight wants to come. It's the drunk guy sitting next to you in the bus. You don't like to see him, and he smells. <laughs> but what he says is making you think, and you think, oh crap, I sh you know, it is too wide, it is too narrow, I should, I should do this, I should do that. Then you have a choice. Either you say, uh, I'm almost done. I'm just going to ignore it. And maybe you have a job when you have a deadline. And these things happen, it's fine. If you don't have a deadline and it does not need to be finished, start over. You don't have to release it. Just put that inside, make a new letter, 
draw it again, and it will get better, and you will notice it will get better. And so what if it takes a month longer, or a year longer? But, I mean, what are you going to do? Pay the bills, of course, but still. You know? Give, let your design, let your letters, uh, uh, be friendly to them, and listen to them, because they will tell you eventually what they need. That was me drawing. I did a little type of a workshop earlier. I'm not going to show you what it is. But if you haven't seen it, uh, go to typecooper.com. It's easy to remember. It's type and cooking. <laughs> it's a little, a, little, a little JavaScript that knows some words about type design. And it will mix up those words, and it will tell you what to draw. Say, so draw something that's wide. High contrast, expansion contrast, serifs, I tell it. Five minutes. Really? Alright. So, then you draw it. Why? Because if you don't let a program, if you don't get these instructions from outside, you will draw the things that you will draw uh, uh, most often. Look at your sketchbooks. There's always one letter you always draw, there's always one style you always draw. So, it would be nice if you exercise and get a little bit out, stretch that idea. That's what Todd Cooper does. Um, very quickly, short science project about digitizing. I sent a scan of, I think, a point Casbon from Enschede to my friends and my students. Could you please digitize this? It doesn't really matter, it's about 100. Everybody sends a letter back, and you think, oh, it's a computer, it's a Bezier, it's numbers, it must be exact. This is the stuff you get back. Really nebulous cloud of, of data. If you superimpose them, if you put them all, this is, this is what it looks like. So maybe on the left, you roughly get an idea of what, what it is like. But they're really difficult, chain difficult, and even so everything is on the baseline. So everything's really sharp there. The stuff here is all over the place. So I cannot really compare it. How, how do I compare this? How do I approach this without me interpreting it? One really beautiful result, even though I cannot guarantee that this will continue. All outlines are different in construction. Everybody puts their contour, their starting point somewhere, their, their curve points. Everything is different. Everything is unique. So the data is Bezier's and math and numbers, but the interpretation is human. It's different brains looking at the same thing, coming up with different results. This is different people singing the same song. They're unique. So many. <coughs> oh, wait, nice little movie. Does it work? Yeah. So I discovered a way of, of uh, processing the numbers, of taking the scale and the, uh, the position out, and, and you get something like this, which is a lot better. It makes a lot more sense. It's tight, it's compact, nothing, it's no longer really uh, sitting on the baseline, it's sort of roughly spread out in all the same places. Um, so you get a place like this, everybody knows how to find the extreme of a curve, but everybody has different ideas on how to connect them. It's beautiful. This is the data spread out. So the tightest pockets are here, right there. So everybody knew kind of got their dots right there, but they're all different. But you look at how this is spread out, this is the transition from a curve into a straight. It's so stretched out. So of course, it looks, it looks obvious when we see it. But now, just quickly reflect on people saying, yes, well, my letter in my font has exactly the same coordinates as your letter in your font, but this just happened by accident. No, it didn't. You copied it. <laughs> and while I wasn't there while you did it, I can now show you with statistical data how incredibly unlikely it is that when you digitize the same shape as I digitize, that you will end up with exactly the same numbers because it will never happen. So, I'm going to wave it at certain people. Uh, this is drawing it back in, taking the average of all of the lines, and then you can. Uh, this is going to go somewhere. To write something about that. Procrustus is the name of the, uh, the method. It was a Greek bandit 
he would hide, he would um, take people hostage and drag them to his house. And if they were taller than his bed, he would saw off the limbs that were not fitting. And if they were too small, he would stretch them out. And some mathematician named this particular method after him, because today his eyes are stretched or chopped. Uh, if you want to uh, digitize one of these, if you want to contribute with this experiment, uh, just send me an email at ericblutter.com or try a letter uh, digitization experiment. By the way, you'll find it. No? Do I have one more, one more minute for this? Yep. Um, finally, uh, in, in, the, in the direction of building tools and doing things that were not possible, um, this is my small contribution to, uh, to type design. Or it's, uh, it's a tool that I made using it. Uh, it's called Superpolator. Um, it's for interpolating <coughs> complex families. So you can you can insert any number of UFO masters, font masters, and then you can take any number of instances out. This is the new version with a new measuring tool, new appearance. These are some slides from the, the, the math. The math, the myth, the math, the myth. <laughs> um, this is what happens when you put colors in, this is what happens when you put type in. So this is a really extreme example of nine masters. So these are nine different fonts. If there's a dot, it's a font. So that's a master, that's a master, that's a master. And there's three at the top, and there's three more at the bottom within two dimensions. So it's only way too quick, but you get this really, really stretched out uh, uh, design space, so many different ways. Uh, just, just to show you that I put some of my money or some of my mouth is uh, build tools to make things, build tools to make ideas possible rather than the other ground. Uh, some, some logo treatments, uh, some animations by Nikola Djuric from Typonite from Croatia to the top. Uh, the interface with a weight axis, a weight axis, and an X height, and a stencil. The thing at the bottom has a weight and a round corner axis. Uh, and here's something that's finally wrapping up. Letter.com is my company. Robofab, if you want to know about scripting in Python and fonts. Robofont is the one true font editor. Uni unified font object. Superpolator is the app. Typecooker is the little drawing thing. Typemedia is a school. House Industries. It's funny, type supplies also, or tools. Font font is where some of the fonts are. Font yeah, yeah, I'm getting I'm getting That's enough. I know, I know. That's good. And thank you very much.